My name is Robert McMullen. I'm a psychiatrist who's been doing psychopharmacology for over 35 years. And I also do TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a giant magnet that either stimulates or inhibits neurons in different sections of the brain, used primarily for depression, but also for other things. Now, what I wanted to talk about was SNRIs. And these are basically the antidepressants that came after the SSRIs. The SSRIs were serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they, re, they blocked the reuptake of serotonin into the first neuron. So then you'd end up with more <coughs> serotonin in the synapse. Now the SNRIs are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So they block the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So both of these <coughs> accumulate in the synapse and then uh, increase certain transmission down the line. There's three uh, monoamines that when they are increased help depression and that's serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine. And, uh, and the dopamine is increased by um, by uh, stimulants like Ritalin and Dexedrine and so on. Now, <clears throat> the SNRIs are medications like Cymbalta, Deloxetine, Effexor, Venlafaxine, Pristique, which is then Desvenlafaxine, and uh, Fetzima, which is Levomilnasopran. The advantage of the SNRIs over the SSRIs are that they usually work about as well, but they are much less likely to cause weight gain, and they're much less likely to cause sexual dysfunction, although they could. But those are two big problems we have with many of our medications is a negative effect on weight and on sexual dysfunction. There were some early studies showing that uh, effects of venlafaxine worked better than the SSRIs for depression in that more people reached a euthymic state, a normal mood, in six weeks than other medications do. Since then, at least I've read recently, it looks like when you compare these SNRIs with SSRIs, there's not much difference in efficacy. And the problem with the Effexor is that it doesn't really become an SNRI until you're above 150 milligrams, which is a pretty significant dose. Below that, it's just an SSRI. And uh, above that, you're going to have a bit more side effects. Another problem with uh, Effexor is that you have to come off it, of it slowly, or you can have some really significant withdrawal. It's not a withdrawal where you crave it. It's just a withdrawal where you feel miserable and sick. And if that happens, there's a pretty easy solution. You just change slowly to a long-acting medication like uh, Prozac fluoxetine. And then once you're on that, you can come off that easily. If you're on Prozac at whatever dose you're on and you stop it suddenly, it takes a good six weeks to wash out so that means you're actually going on a slow taper if you stop it suddenly. So you almost never have any withdrawal from Prozac. Of course, it would be better to 
also reduce that somewhat slowly. Now, <clears throat> how, do, how do the SNRIs work? Again, these uh, monoamines seem to increase transmission via, in this case, serotonin and norepinephrine. However, it's much more complicated than that because immediately within hours of taking this, your serotonin and norepinephrine in the synapse is greatly increased. In the studies, where they usually go up on the dose fairly fast, it is about 10 days when you start to see a statistically significant improvement in mood. We used to say six weeks for some reason, but when you look at the actual research, the, uh, the improvement starts at about 10 days. You've and, it's hmm? like... Yeah, it's, then it's gradual after that, but it, there's a statistical separation between the uh, real medicine and a placebo at about 10 days. And statistically significant means uh, that if you win three chess games and I win two, then we can't really say that you're a better chess player. But if you win 300 and I win 200, we can say that in all likelihood you're a better chess player. And that's how the researchers uh, make a distinction about how uh, one medication is actually better than another or better than a placebo. They have a s statistical way of working that out. <coughs> And then the person hopefully gradually improves. And that can take six weeks, two weeks, three months. And, and sometimes you have to add in other things to uh, augment the benefit, like a low dose of lithium or a low dose of uh, a thyroid hormone called Cytomel, which is T3. And there's are a number of... Um, other things such as nutrients that are used as supplements and have double-blind studies showing that they work, and those include inositol, NAC, NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, and fish oil, and now it looks like probiotics also help. The side effects of the SNRIs can be very similar to the SSRIs, although with less likelihood of the sexual dysfunction and less likelihood of weight gain. They're also a little bit less likely to cause sedation and a little bit more likely to cause activation in some people to cause some agitation. And this often means, or can mean, that the person is a little bipolar. And we have bipolar people on one side where they have swings and movement in, in moods, especially manic depression, and then we have people that are purely unipolar. But then there's a vast number of people that are in a spectrum between that, where they're not really very bipolar, but they're not completely unipolar. And there's a great book called uh, uh, A Spectrum Approach to Mood Disorders by James Phelps that came out in 2016, and a lot of psychiatrists are very excited about this book. And he has a great website that's very good for patients to uh, look at. Also the book, maybe. Oh yeah, this is, this is the book here. The Spectrum Approach 
to mood disorders. Not fully bipolar, but not unipolar. Practical management. It's a great book, and and uh, and non MDs can read it very well. And he's a clinician. He's worked all his life taking care of a lot of patients as well as being university affiliated and being involved with some research. And I think that makes the book much more interesting. Usually textbooks are written by people that are more academic, so they are a collection of summaries of a lot of research and uh, can be a little numbing, a little boring. Whereas he has a lot of little insights about dealing with people and, uh, and talking about how far one can go with pushing somebody to take something that they don't really want to take and things like that. It, it's, a, it's a great book and it's a very interesting to read. <clears throat> now, uh, with people that are a little bit bipolar, they can poop out with either SSRIs or these SNRIs. But the SNRIs seem somewhat worse, that they're a little bit more likely to cycle people. And so they may help, and they may bring you up to normal for a while. And, uh, and not necessarily going slightly above normal, just the top part of the bipolar can just be normal. But then, some few months later, you sink into a big depression. Uh, I have a patient I saw today who I've been treating 10 years. He's been hospitalized a number of times, including at the National Institute of Mental Health for treatment-resistant depression. And uh, I think he's a little bipolar because he's been on all, all these medicines and they haven't worked. And uh, he recently got hospitalized for a medical problem. All his medications were stopped. And I wrote a letter saying that I would like them not to start him on antidepressants because I had a feeling he would do better on no antidepressants for a while. And then we'll think about what to do and maybe use low-dose lithium and low-dose lamictal, lamotrigine. And sure enough, he's in a normal mood. I've never seen him like this. And he's on virtually no medication. They did start him on some things I'm not that enthusiastic about <clears throat> and uh, and I'm going to try to reduce them but he was better and in a normal mood before he was started on these agents anyhow um, so these antidepressants are not without risk especially if they're not working or if they work for a while and then poop out um, Usually people start with an SSRI and then if the person doesn't do well, then they start out, then they move to an SNRI. But you don't have to do that. You, you could just start out with an SNRI right away. What is the best SNRI? Um, all the SNRIs actually work for anxiety. You, even though you would think they wouldn't work as well because of the norepinephrine in them. Norepinephrine is a, is a monoamine that uh, is more stimulating. And, uh, and in fact, it helps with the concentration. So somebody with attention deficit disorder, it helps. Um, I think... Uh, the best ones are uh, Cymbalta, Deloxetine, and Prestige, which is Desvenlafaxine, period. I've used uh, Effexor, Venlafaxine, a lot, but uh, you have to go to fairly high doses before it becomes a, a medication that affects both receptors. Below 150 milligrams, it's strictly works on serotonin. And above that, you're also getting into the range of a bit more side effects. Cymbalta deloxetine is affecting both receptors even at very low doses. I haven't used desvenlafaxine, 
which is Pristique as much. Nor have I used a lot of Fetsima. But uh, they also seem to be very effective. And again, if they have significant benefit, my leaning would be not to change them, but to add things to them. And nowadays, a lot of us are starting everybody on ultra-low doses of lithium, like uh, 150 milligrams a day, because in a surprising number of people, it really helps out. And uh, either in a couple of weeks or as the months and years go by. That is my little summary on the SNRIs. Thank you very much.